Hello, today we're going to talk about functions and their representations. This is corresponds to section 1.1 and 1.2 in the book. Um, it's also stuff that I expect you've mostly seen in pre-calculus. It will mostly be review for you, hopefully a little bit of, of new material. So the basic starting point is a function is a rule that assigns an output number to each input number. So before I give an example, I just want to give some names to some of those things. The domain is what we call the set of all possible input numbers. Okay, all the things that you can apply the rule to is called the domain. All the things you can get out is called the range. Okay, so now let's do an example. Um, here's a rule. This rule, f of x equals square root of x plus 1, says take a number, an input number x, take its square root, and add 1. That's the output. Okay, so that is to say that the input, this is also called the independent variable. It is traditional to make that independent variable, the thing representing the input x, but you can use any any symbol for it. And then the result we write as f of x. That's the output. Okay. You can, those are kind of traditional, but you can um, use any letter for either. So I could say g of t equals square root of t plus 1. So now the independent variable, the input is t, and the output is g of t, but it's the same function in the sense that when you put any number in for t or x, you get the same number out for f or g. And I'll also say while I'm here that lots of times, um, instead of writing it as f of x that reminds you that it's a function dependent on x, often people will use a different variable to represent the output in which case that is called, um, traditionally it's y, and it's called the dependent variable. Okay, and then in this case, if you want to plug a number in, you write it this way. If I want to plug in an input of 0, then I say f of 0, the output corresponding to 0, is, and then I just plug that number into the formula, square root of 0 plus 1, which is 1. The output when you put in 1 is the square root of 1 plus 1, which is 2, and the output when you put in 4 is the square root of 4 plus 1, which is 2 plus 1, which is 3. Okay, so um, that's pretty simple, but that notation is a little weird. People often get thrown by that f of x, what it means symbolically. It's just referring to the result when you plug then that number in for x. What's the domain here? Well, notice you can only take square root of a number that's greater than or equal to 0, right? Negative numbers don't have square roots. So that means that the domain of this function is all real numbers x, which are greater than or equal to 0. That's a mathy way of writing it. We won't usually use that notation. We'll usually write it as an interval. So it's all the numbers from 0 to infinity. So the interval from 0 to infinity um, and now I'm going to teach you something a little technical. Zero is included. Zero, the endpoint zero is included in the interval because you can take the square root of zero. Infinity is not because it's not a number. So we're going to use a square bracket. We always put brackets or parentheses around an interval to show it's an interval. If it's a square bracket, that's indicating that point is included, and a round bracket indicates that point is excluded. Okay, And we're happy to mix them. So in the future, I will 
much later in the course. I will expect you to be comfortable with that. Right now, I don't. In the online homework, it will sometimes ask you to give things like domains in interval notation. When it does, it's happy with either round or square brackets. Okay, so it's a distinction you don't yet have to be responsible for, but you will, so start to get comfortable with it. Likewise, the range You take the square root of something, it's always at least zero, zero or positive. And then, so if you take the square root of something and add one, it's always greater than or equal to one. So that means that the range in interval notation goes from one to infinity. And again, one is included, infinity is not. All right, so that's one example of a function. That's an example of a function represented algebraically. Okay, there's four ways to represent functions. The one you're most used to from algebra and pre-calculus is algebraic when you represent it as a formula. So f of x equals square root of x plus 1, g of t equals t squared plus 4, y equals the cosine of x, all of those are functions expressed algebraically. You generally find all of the mathematical things we want to do can be done very easily with a function that's expressed algebraically, but that doesn't happen very often in the real world. Um, so how else might a function be expressed? Well, it can be expressed visually or graphically. You will remember that we represent functions graphically on a Cartesian coordinates. We draw a horizontal line and label it x to represent the um, x-axis, which is to say the independent variable, and we pick a scale on it, however we like. And then we draw a vertical line, label it y to represent the dependent variable, pick a scale on it. And then we draw a curve to represent a function. Um, I want to get the numbers right, so I'm going to pick a few points ahead of time and then connect the dots. So there's my curve. Um, and that represents a function. The way that represents a function is that if you ask, so I'll, I'll call that y equals f of x, and if you ask for its value at 1 or 0 or 4, that just says take that input value of 1, Imagine a vertical line at that point on the x-axis, point 1 or 0 or 4, where that vertical line touches the curve, you go horizontally over to measure its height. Its height is 2, so that tells you f of 1 is 2. f of 0, draw the vertical line at x equals 0, hits the curve at y equals 1, so f of 0 is 1. And here, f of 4, it's the vertical line here, which is at 3, so f of 4 equals 3. Okay, So the curve, by its height, at a given x value, tells you what the output is. The input is along the x-axis, the output is along the y-axis. Notice in this case that 0 gets assigned to 1, 1 gets assigned to 2, and 4 gets assigned to 3. Well, that wasn't what I meant to do, but... Um, those are the same assignments as we got out of f of x equals the square root of x plus 1. So I could say that this graph represents square root of x plus 1. Okay, we will spend about half our time working algebraically with formulas and half our time working visual, visually with graphs. We will go back and forth and get really comfortable um, relating simple things in each arena arena to the other. Um, we will spend less time on functions described numerically, but that's in some sense the simplest. If somebody gives you a table of values, like this, That describes a function in the sense that um, if I want to know what f, what some input value is, you just find the input value 
um, in the x column, so you find 0 in the x column, and in the y column, in the second column, is the value f of x. So f of 0 is equal to 1, f of 1 is equal to 2, f of 4 is equal to 3, and so on. Okay, so in each case, you find the corresponding row in the table. Of course, this table doesn't tell you what f of 1 half is or what f of 5 is. So it only tells you the value of the function for certain finite values. So that makes it of limited usefulness. But we will learn a little bit about how to approximate lots of things we do in the visual and algebraic realms in the numerical realm. And that's very important because many of the functions you'll deal with in your life, you will only have numerically. You only have a table of values that you got by taking some kind of measurement. Underlying all of these is the verbal representation that's in words. So of course you could describe kind of a formula in words. You could say, well, take the input, take its square root, and add one. That would be verbal. But more commonly, it represents a physical situation. So let's say Could describe a function whose input is time of day and whose output is the temperature in my living room. So if somebody asked you what's f of 2, you'd have to go at 2 o'clock to my living room with a thermometer and measure the temperature. Okay, So that describes a function. Every input has a unique output. Um, it's not clear how practical that is. Like maybe you can, you know, you could leave a thermometer that kind of records to a file or something. You could get lots of data. So you could maybe draw a graph. You could certainly get a table. You probably can't represent that by a formula. What, as you move beyond calculus, you will find the most functions you care about are verbal, and maybe you have access to them numerically. Um, but rarely, in some situations, you can model those functions pretty well by algebraic. You can certainly draw a graph that connects the dots and does a reasonable approximation of representing the function. Um, so we're learning how to deal with really well-expressed functions algebraically and visually so that we can begin in future life to um, bring the same tools to bear on the functions you'll see in real life, which are often numerical and verbal. So I want to spend a little more time on the visual and graphical representations. Um, so here's a graph, okay? The red line represents some function y equals f of x, and you can see that f of negative 2 is 0, f of 0 is 2, f of 1 is 0, and so on. Okay, So once again, a graphical representation of a function um, allows you at least to estimate the output given any input. Um, it also makes sense to talk about the domain. The graph only appears between negative 2 and 4. So the domain is going to go from negative 2 to 4. And notice I filled in this dot here. That emphasizes the fact that that point, negative 2, really is the function makes sense and it's 0. So negative 2 is included in the domain. When I leave an empty circle, I'm saying you can't plug 4 in even though it looks like you should plug in 4 in and get 0. That's not included in the domain, so we'll do a round curve. That seems like a sort of nitpicky technical point. Most of the time it is, but every once in a while it really matters. Um, okay, the range. The biggest value that ever occurs as you trace this curve along happens here. At x equals 0, it gets up to 2. The smallest value that happen, happens, the lowest the curve gets, is minus 2. Um, so that means that the range goes from minus 2 to 2. Both of those values are included, so we get two square braces, okay? because you actually can hit y equals 2 and you can hit y equals negative 2. 
Um, while we're here on graphical functions, I'm going to introduce one more um, important idea, uh, which is when the function is increasing or decreasing. Let's change colors. By that I mean, as you travel from left to right, is the height increasing or decreasing? Okay, so um, it's pretty clear that here, as you travel from left to right, you're increasing as you, you go up. So it's pointed up and to the right. Between 0 and, let's call that 3, it's decreasing. The curve goes down. And then between 3 and 4, the curve goes up. Okay, so here's how we're going to write that. The curve is increasing from minus 2 to 0. These are the x values. And also from 3 to 4. Okay, so that and also is represented by this union, this cup symbol. So there are two intervals together represent where it's increasing. It's traditional when we think carefully about increasing, this will really make sense. But for now, just just accept we usually leave out the endpoints because we don't want to think about what would it mean to be increasing at those weird points. Um, and then it's decreasing from 0 to 3. Okay, Why is that interesting? Well, if you think about um, verbal descriptions, in particular, if the deep independent variable is time, then that means the quantity really is increasing. So if the graph is increasing in the sense that I just said, then let's say the temperature in my living room, that's when it is increasing, when it's getting warmer. And that's obviously an interesting question. When is it getting warmer? When is it getting colder? When is the market going up? When is inflation going down? It turns out many, many interesting questions about real functions, modeling real situations. Some of the most interesting behavior to talk about is when it's increasing or decreasing. I'm going to stop here and continue in future.